the main structural thing is how do you anchor the structure to the ground. Right. So you want to make sure all the forces on that thing, the building, are transferring into the, their load into the ground. And that's like the basic principle of structural engineering for a building. You're listening to The Azria Show. If you're looking for quality real estate investing information that you can trust, you've found it. Stay tuned and join the tens of thousands of members that have already benefited from Azria, your home for education, market information, support, and networking opportunities that will advance your real estate investing career. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Azria Show. I am your host, Marcus Maloney, and we have our executive director and co-host, Mike Del Preet. Hello, hello. Welcome. Thank you for the warm introduction, yes. Mike. Thank you for us being here. Very warm introduction. So today we're going to be talking about something completely different, completely off the grid, something that me and Mike have absolutely no idea about. So we brought in a local expert to talk to us about it, right? So we're going to be talking about architectural design. And one of the big things that's going on is ADUs, correct? Because the additional dwelling units in Phoenix, we're running out of space and we need some space for our investors really to increase their cash flow on their property. So we have Nicholas Santakis. Help yep. me, Nick. Help me. Santakis. <laughs> Nicholas Santakis here today. He is a local architectural expert. I mean, he's been in the business for quite some time. So we're going to be talking about quite a bit of things on today. So Let's welcome to the episode, Nick. Thank you for having me. All right. So I know you're a second generation architect, correct? Yep. Why did you decide to follow your father's footsteps? Uh, well, at first it was more of just a, what do I declare as my major in university? So I just kind of ticked the box. And uh, even though I'd worked in the office, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an architect. Mm -hmm. But kind of what really got me there and what's kind of gotten me to where I am here today, and especially with you guys, is I started reading and learning about some of these major big architects and how they were espousing kind of these, these grand kind of big design ideas where they're making this very big difference through the buildings that they're creating. And mm -hmm. they had views for cities, ideal cities, ideal buildings, and how to house the most amount of people in kind of the most beautiful kind of way. So that's kind of what really jump started that love for architecture okay awesome well real quick in the beginning dwell boldly we didn't say your company's name and you are an Azria business associate so you can see nick at mm -hmm. our monthly meetings in person or obviously we'll, we'll we'll let you know how to get a hold of them so i want to put that out there mark yeah absolutely yeah. thank you that's why that's why you're that's a co-host man we work together <laughs> with teammates all right kind of tell us like on an average day what do you do as an architect because not Often do people say, hey, I'm an architect and this is what I do. In my mind, I'm thinking you're just around drawing sketches all day. Am I, am I correct? We're just podcasting all day. Oh, okay. okay. So you do what me and Mike do pretty much. <laughs> no, it is a lot of drawing. I mean, obviously client meetings, there's uh, different softwares we have to know as far as how to draw. And just, yes, it's, a, it's just kind of a lot of sitting there drawing, thinking, a lot of uh, reflection and then okay. and designing, yeah. So I'm not much of an artist. Can I still be an architect? Or do I just need to be able to draw straight lines and have a protractor? And <laughs> You can, I believe, because I was really bad when I first started, that it is as just like kind of anything, you got to hone the skill. Okay. And it's not just a natural ability. I don't think it's, you're just born talented. I think it's something you have to kind of nurture, work at, and I think that's when you could get good. Okay. And it's, I mean, the first bathroom I designed took me like, six hours and I was like this is a terrible layout <laughs> and you know now it doesn't take me that long but it, mm -hmm. ta it takes a long time to get there so okay, um, I awesome. would say I think anyone could do it it is a lot of hours it's a lot of education but to me it's worth it well, okay so Marcus said a word he said protractor sometimes he makes things up is, is that a thing <laughs> Of course, yeah. Okay. All right, all right, all right. What's the protractor, man? All right, cool. Compass, your you still use, you still use it in the business? Not really, no. <laughs> exactly. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. No, I mean, there was some hand drawing. We learned hand drafting in school. So the technical drawing is called drafting. So right. there are plenty of draftsmen out there who I would say are not artists, but okay. they're, good at, they're good at drawing. But drafting, yes, and it used to all be done by hand. Okay, and to figure out a proper angle, you needed a protractor. So, Mike, <laughs> yeah. the protractor was the little silver thing, and it had the little, the little pencil. 
You hold it one spot. Okay. And you do yeah, the yeah. Circle. Okay. See, see. Okay. Light Pay attention yeah, yeah, yeah. in school, man. So, so <laughs> how does being an archi uh, architect, how, what's the role between real estate investor and architect? How do we work together? So I think, I mean, that's a question I'm still asking myself, but the whole reason I was kind of attracted by the association is one, I was just a regular member at one point, mm -hmm. and I thought I could offer something to, to investors, and mm -hmm. it was mostly about zoning. So a lot of people I talk to, they're like, well, how many units can I get on here um, on this multifamily lot, or how much can I add to this house to make it better if it's single family? And I thought zoning is kind of that missing piece for people who want to maximize the value of their property. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's say you own you own something and rather than trying to go find a whole new property or recreate a good deal maybe it makes sense to look kind of inward at your inventory expand expand a single family home or expand multifamily build something there and in order to understand that you have to know about zoning okay so i get confused on yes me I'm, too. I'm like a monsoon right where for armless it's like R1. The, there was the zoning oh. and then it's like county zoning like city zoning county zoning it, do you follow? The person who's governing the zoning is more, is the jurisdiction that has kind of rights over the land. So mm -hmm. we're basically where you're submitting permits to. The county sometimes has different, we'll call a house, let's say a, a double family home or something mm -hmm. to that effect. But what really counts is the jurisdiction that the property's in. So the city? C basically yeah. city, but okay. it could be county too. When it says no city jurisdiction, it's county. It's county. And the county has its own zoning ordinance. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, so zoning, let's talk about it. What should we know? Throw something out there and we'll start snowballing. Okay, so we could start, well, let's say single family, because okay. it's kind of mm -hmm. simple, and let's just keep it Phoenix, because Phoenix, yeah. whatever, big city, a lot of people own property in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. The biggest things that are kind of, that zoning kind of puts regulation on is building height, lot coverage, number of units, which is not super appropriate for single family, even though there is a density number that they put on everything, mm -hmm. and then your property setback. So those are kind of the biggest things. So a building setback would be how far you're allowed your building to come to the property line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Building height is pretty obvious, it's just the t the height from the bottom to the top of the structure. And it does get more complex in different situations, but generally that's it. They'll regulate, so even though th usually it's 30 feet for single family zoning, you still can't go over two stories. So you can't sneak in three stories on a house like that. Generally speaking, you could put a basement. Basement doesn't count in certain situations. Right. So there are there are ways around it. But this is why understanding the zoning helps. So zoning will have definitions on what a story is. So if you're ever wondering, you could go in there, look at their definition chapter, and figure these things out. So building setbacks, building height, lot coverage is kind of the big one in Phoenix. So if you have a single family home and it says you could do 40% lot coverage, that would mean the net lot area of, of your property under roof, so livable square footage, garage, plus covered patio and porch um, can only equal 40% of the total. Okay. So 10,000 square foot lot, you could build 4,000 square feet. Interesting. Did exactly. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Under, and under roof, so not livable, just all under roof. Got okay. It. Got it. And if you have a second story is nicely on top of the first story, it won't count for additional lot coverage. That's why a lot of people, once they feel like they're landlocked, well, you could always just go, go up. up. Well, there, there was a good point last night in our multifamily subgroup. Someone said here in Phoenix on the west side, they were doing an ADU. And here in Phoenix, you know, I'm from back east, so no, there was no fences. You saw everyone's backyard and everything like that. So now I guess fences, block fences go six, six foot, I guess is what they can be. And then I guess he built an ADU, which overlooked the neighbor's yard. So now there's neighbors are complaining and it was approved by the city. There's nothing illegal there. It was just a mm -hmm. hassle with the neighborhood. So have you run, in, ran, run into that at all? I have. So city of Phoenix too. So part of the zoning ordinance, will talk about primary structures and then secondary structures. Mm -hmm. So an ADU, I guess, would be auxiliary dwelling unit, but it would it would have a different set of rules than let's say the main the main building. Mm -hmm. So they'll govern. They'll have a separate height requirement for you know separate detached structures, and then in the side yard, they'll govern. They also govern the height of walls. Usually, side yard side yard is six to eight feet. Same thing with the rear. Okay. And the front is usually three. Got it. Because yeah. I thought he said something about like raised. Okay. Does that make sense? Like like yeah, if you put it on like a foundation or a podium yeah. or something. Got it. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Well, that clears that up. Yeah. But the building height would be from bottom of structure, basically from ground to the top of the structure. So Got that's it. where if the neighbor had wanted to make a real argument, they'd have to go back to the zoning ordinance and kind of figure all these things out. Okay. And where can we get these? Is it all on the website, like government website, the, all the zoning laws? At almost every single city, 
basically the whole country will have its own zoning ordinance published online. I also okay. noticed like sometimes I'll just call the city and if you get a hold of them, they, they're pretty helpful answering those questions. Sometimes it's hard to get them on the phone and sometimes you have to ask them also, like, can you be more specific or show me where in the ordinance? Mm-hmm. Because cause sometimes they'll say something and they're not bound and they make it very clear mm-hmm. that right. they're not bound by any verbal advice they give you. But obviously, if you don't know, you're going to take their word yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. Then you build right. something and then they say, nope, this is not, not within the zoning. So that's okay. where you come in, though. Exactly. Yeah. That's us. And then I always verify my own information with them, too. And right. I make them send, send me an email saying that. So if they're wrong and I and I advise a client accordingly, they'll we could hold them to the fire basically. Okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So and speaking about ADUs because that's a that's a hot topic. Give us some insight on ADUs. How prevalent is it now going to be in the Phoenix city of Phoenix and what about some of the surrounding cities, Mesa, Buckeye, Glendale? I think some already allow it and even in Phoenix there's Depending on your zoning, there are some that would allow a guest house or ADU. And then what it sounds like is now the major difference is the R1 zonings are going to add in an ADU. So all I've really read is that they're planning on letting it happen because okay. before you weren't allowed to have a separate kitchen or a major cooking appliance in a, in a detached building and they had a few different rules to follow. Mm. So now it sounds like they're going to allow it and then it's going to have like similar criteria where they'll, they'll cap the building height, okay. stuff like that. And it's only for a single family to live in there. And I was also reading that the owner of the property actually must has to live in there or one of the provisions will be that they have to live in, the in one house. or the, they'd have to live in the main okay. house, one or the other. Gotcha. So gotcha. single, R1 single family. R1 is typically single family and that's just Phoenix. Everywhere else, everywhere has their own kind of designations, but Phoenix, mm-hmm. all the ones that say R1, will be single family zoning. All right, so that's coming down the pipeline or it's here? Down the pipeline. So I can't remember exactly where they are in the in the legal kind of stuff, but they presented it to like, not the main city council or like a few of the members of council yeah. who, mm-hmm. have, who are thinking it's a good Sub-committee idea. Subcommittee, yeah, kind of like before it goes to the full committee. Yeah. Okay, so in regards to that, so is there any speculation or anything like that as far as like how big the ADU can be compared to the main house or compared to the lot size of the property? So I don't know, but what I did read, because I haven't read the the specifics, Okay. but I do know they are, I think it, it says something about capping it at a, a thousand square feet, which I think is okay. pretty generous. Yeah. There's going to be a distance between main building and that unit. Mm-hmm. And also your lot coverage is still going to govern. So you're still okay. not going to be allowed to go over your lot coverage. Gotcha. Yeah. So going back to the example, if you have a 1,000 square foot, a 10,000 square foot lot and your lot coverage is four, what was it, 4,000? Yeah. On a 10, 40, yeah, on a ten yeah. yeah, on a 10,000 square foot lot. Okay. So you can have a 2,000 square foot house, including the garage, and then you can do another 1,000 mm-hmm. square foot. It should be okay. Yeah. Generally speaking. Generally, yeah. I guess yeah. when we find out what it, how it actually reads. Right. Yeah. And it's different because, like you said, the lot lines, you know, what if your main house sets back a little bit further? So there's a lot to take into consideration there. That's why we always bring in an architect. Right. So, okay. So we talked about the zoning. So you did your research. You called the city, called you. And next thing would what? Per- permitting roughly you get yeah what's the price let's, let's, let's kind of walk through it so they call you consultation do you do consultations yeah i'll do a phone call always for free Let, let's talk mm-hmm. about it and because i know and understand that people just don't know this stuff going yeah. into it so we always do that but the the first step that phone call almost always leads to we need to do your zoning research basically mm-hmm. and it depends on the extent of what someone's trying to do so i just call it in the custom world i call it my custom home diagnostic mm-hmm in the investment world, I call it my investment property analysis. Cool. So okay. that's the abbreviation's IPA. So All right. There you go. So, but it is. It's basically yeah. There's so much that goes into it that we don't want to just start designing right away. So someone says, I want a house. It needs three bed, two bath on this property. I'm like, okay, that's great. And they'll give me square f- square footage. But the first thing I'd like to do is understand what the lot's going to allow us to do. Of course. So before we get too far. There, you know, there's a fee for this diagnostic, but it lets you move forward with confidence that you mm-hmm. can build what you want instead of trying to build, get a permit, and then find out from zoning that it's not been approved, and now you've just done way too much work. Yep. So you guys, you, they pay the fee, do the diagnostic, and then you agree to the plan. So what, what happens next? Do you submit the plans to the city, or how does that work? Okay, so we do diagnostic. 
then I split our dev design phase, and most people will do it, if not this, exactly the same, they'll do something similar. Where you do, it's called just preliminary design, is the diagnostic part, and then we'll do like schematic design. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll design floor plan, and I start with floor plan first, mm -hmm. kind of always. Mm -hmm. And we, we make sure that, and most people understand floor plan, that's what mm -hmm. they've seen kind of the most. So what's good is we get final on the, on the layout of the space, make sure all the spaces they want are there, but also make sure they're in the right spot so that um, we know, at least when we're designing, we could see it kind of in three dimensions, but we're only presenting a 2D thing to a client. Um, and we break it into a simple stage, which is, this is the floor plan. You like it? Oh no, you know, let's move this bathroom there. Let's move this there. We make all those changes and we go through that process until floor plan is perfect. Then we'll move into um, a 3D phase and an elevation stage. So we'll look at how the building looks from the outside. Okay. And that's kind of when it gets exciting. Mm -hmm. When it's like, okay, mm -hmm. let's, and that's also usually where people's mind can't view a floor plan in 3D. That's when we could get people kind of directly engaged in like, in how it looks. Like what are the roofs doing? Is it a flat roof? Is it a pitch roof? All these things. So we figure that out. And then from there we go into, it's called construction documents. Mm -hmm. Construction documents are all the engineering that, that goes in. So structural, structural engineering, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical drawings. And then we have our own set of architectural drawings that need to be submitted. And this is when we're doing kind of the city set of drawings. And that's what they're going to want to see to give you a building permit. Real quick, so while you're doing, we see the construction phase, now in like the engineers and stuff, so is the your client in the process also, ha are you talking to a general contractor, a builder, engineers? Are they, Is there like a group of people in this process or is it kind of you still? It is a group of people. Some architects will have a lot of these in-house. Okay. I hire them as consulting consulting okay. firms, and most most engineering firms are set up as consulting firms. So there are some that consolidate, but not overly important and not overly common for especially single family and smaller multifamily. So we hire them separately, but under our overarching mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of managing the consultants, and especially like you know if you couldn't understand like what the house is going to look like on the outside, and then like the mechanical systems, plumbing systems, like yeah. that goes way over people's heads. But clients are always encouraged or allowed to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So we'll always, we'll always let them ask whatever they want and we'll, we'll go through things. But most, most of the time during that phase, it's a lot of us working heads down, like we're talking about before. Like we're okay. on the computer just drafting. Right, drafting. We use a protractor and, and go. What's like the time frame from an initial client coming in for a consultation to we have the 3D cat drawing it's it's very hard to predict what that's going to be but usually what i'll say uh, for the diagnostic phase it'll be about two weeks okay so we meet we go on site so there'll be a site visit go on site take notes take detailed photos of the property then about two weeks to compile all the information and uh, and we draft a report that we send to the client then after that we enter the design services agreement and floor plan usually i'll quote three four weeks uh, 3ds and elevations probably more like about six weeks to get to the final of that. And that's kind of the design phase. Then construction documents is when it gets, dep it depends a lot on how the workload of your engineers. Gotcha. So it's harder to predict, but usually I'll predict about eight, like eight to 12 weeks. So we, wow. we get a, we give ourselves like a fudge space. Okay. But that's, so I guess there's two different kind of client paths. that will be more kind of the the custom, custom client right. or the client who is who really wants to be involved in like every stage. If you want to, we could go faster, we can move faster if we're a little bit left on our own and we could bring a client in at strategic phases. So it depends how much involvement the client wants, uh, especially okay. when it's an investor. So gotcha. it varies. So I'm doing one for someone who had, it was mostly there, they're just adding kind of a bathroom. It was a duplex. So his overall quote to get to city was just eight weeks from start to finish. Okay. So it's just it it varies a lot and depends on the the goals of the client and how, and what they what they want. Is it a little bit easier when you're doing spec homes and there's just like I want the same thing cookie cutter and I want twenty of them. Spec well, it's a little difficult to to just repeat, but it is of course that's a, what everyone always asks us. <laughs> oh, really? <Yeah. laughs> right. I want the Guys, same the thing. Exact <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, let's take a step back. Let's look at zoning. It seriously it, it always starts at that same spot is this law going to let us do what we just mm -hmm. did on that one, mm -hmm. right? If now we're talking Phoenix, uh, but now we want to do it in PV. PV is a little bit different than mm -hmm. Phoenix. Oh, the lot's a rectangle. This one's more square. Right. So there's going to be a lot of differences. So that's kind of dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. But spec home uh, builders 
are often kind of our, our one of our favorite clients. Mm-hmm. And most because they get it, they're not going to ask a million questions or, or change. Mm-hmm. You know, this door, I would really like it if it was moved, you know, like four feet to the left. Mm-hmm. I think that would just feel right. Spec home builder doesn't really care. And right. <laughs> right. Sense, yeah. They care. They care, right? But also, usually the spec home builder tends to be um, the investor and the general contractor. Mm-hmm. Different thinking. Yeah. Different thinking. And also, they know they could change things in the field. They know the things they can change in the field that are inconsequential to the drawing set. Mm-hmm. So when you start getting architect and builder together, and actually one of my articles was about this, it was about if you're an investor, try getting a partner who's a general contractor. They're like, they're going to save you a lot. And obviously, if you get them engaged, you're not going to pay their fees. You're going to pay them, obviously, right. as an investor. But what they're going to work hard for you, and it makes our, our job as architects also easier. Because huh, cool. they know what, yep. you know, it wasn't on the permit that this door was like five feet over. City doesn't care. Builder doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares. So they know they know which things can be. Let's I wouldn't say omitted, but what things are crucial and what things are not. Got mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah good perfect. point there. All right, and you know, you, like you mentioned in your article, so Nick writes for our Ezria newsletter every month. We get a nice. Been doing it for a couple months now. No, like, probably a little more than that since February. But so probably the first one was in March. Okay. Yeah, man, check out a lot of wealth of information. So. All right, so do you have a question? Yeah, I got a question. So we was talking about permits and everything like that. I know before we had started, you had talked about the residential permit by inspector. What's what's that? That's a specific to City of Phoenix. And when it's, I think it's, it's 1,000 or 1,200 square feet and nothing major structurally. So not structural steel or not doing anything overly mm-hmm. complex. They'll review it. The review time is about two weeks total, and it's just kind of admin time on okay. the city of Phoenix's side to just kind of log in the plans and get it done. And the technical thing is you're not really getting a permit right away. You're getting kind of permission to build, and then you're getting the permit as you go. So by the end, you have a building permit and CFO at the same time. Okay. And it's all done in the field. Versus the other way is you have to wait and do the whole permit, and that can take months correct that could take months especially with city of phoenix right now okay the other difference for our pbi so residential permit by inspector is you need to have a general contractor associated with a permit okay so gen and they they have to just do one additional meeting at the beginning it's like a pre-construction meeting they meet the inspector owner inspector builder meet on site discuss what they're doing and then just go. Okay. Would this be beneficial for like fixing flippers is doing scrape buildups or? Yeah, most, yeah. For okay. fixing flippers, I think that's that's the appropriate way to go. Okay. So a lot quicker than going the whole route because, you know, it's speed, speed to market. So you fixing flippers out there, check that out if you haven't already. Yep. Yeah, they have information online. They have a brochure on there that kind of outlines it. The only thing is, you do need to have that general contractor license. Right. That's kind of the biggest thing. Okay. So what can you teach us about the permitting world? We should, some tips, some things we should look for, some time frames. What's all that look like now? I think the best piece of advice is always be nice to the plan reviewers. Mm-hmm. So send <laughs> sure. like some edible, edible arrangements and something like that. <laughs> they can't accept bribes, <laughs> but they do appreciate kindness. So there you okay. go. just always be nice to them because even though they're acting at an incredibly slow pace and it's very frustrating, they also have a lot going on. Mm-hmm. So, so I realized, you know, the nicer you are and kind of the more projects you get in there, they get nicer as you go. Okay. So build that relationship and start it from the beginning and then it'll start, it'll feel better. And th- they say they don't, but they kind of review your stuff a little bit faster yeah. Yeah. and they'll, they'll do a few nicer things for you. The permitting world is not super fun, but it is protecting, it's protecting the city, you know, mm-hmm. from it's pregnant, mm-hmm. but it's also protecting the investor. So it's not always, it has like a negative connotation, I find, but I don't, I don't really find it negative. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, if someone gets hurt in your building, that's Safety. much worse, yeah. you know, than you spent an extra few weeks. Mm-hmm. Not saying it's not, those few weeks aren't important and, and all that, but it, it does kind of safeguard you a little bit as the okay. owner. So what are some examples is, you know, sometimes you drive around, you see stop work signs. So what, what, what have those investors or flippers or builders done to get that? Just 
Just not applying for a permit when they should have. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Does it, does stop work happen during? Like, even if you do apply for a permit, like, do they check in and say it's, you're not doing things right? Do they, how's that look? I don't think it would be called a stop work order. They're just going to fail your inspection. So stop work means they didn't apply for a permit. Just okay. Got, got yes. it. Got yes. it. Okay. I thought it might be midway through or something. No. Okay. No, that means they just didn't apply for a permit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good lead. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't apply for a permit. Yeah, there you go. I had someone Take like that. Offer. It's not really a good lead because they're <laughs> usually the person who doesn't care about permitting and hates the whole process. But mm-hmm. I'm the person who has to tell them, well, sorry, yeah. there is a process. Yeah, <laughs> there's, right. there are rules right. to follow. Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. So I have a question. I had a, a multifamily. I have a lot of questions. but And so basically it was squatters and they were stealing electricity. And literally... After I bought the property and got them out, and I was ready to put everything in my name, they went and pulled all the – APS came and pulled all the boxes. After these people were squatting there for like three years, stealing electricity, not one issue. Mm-hmm. But once I bought the house, they came and just ripped – pulled the box, the panels off. Did you ever hear that? Nope. But it sounds like you, you have to pay the bill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. I'm yeah. like, why did they – anyways, I thought maybe you didn't know. <laughs> well, because they couldn't. Maybe I got to call customer service. <laughs> well, it must have been because now they could put it on somebody. Yeah. Before they, yeah, uh, they could. Oh, man. Wow. Anyways. All right. What else we got here? I have a question. Mm-hmm. We talk about zoning, permitting. Um, anything you want to get across to our members and our listeners that we should know about you and your service? I guess just that I, I kind of love investors. So we, were, we mentioned second generation. It's second generation architect, but also entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what I love about, so I love entrepreneurship and I find that the most successful investors, right, treat it like as if it's their, their business and, it, and that's what I love about people. So I love sharing that and being around people who share those kind of values. Awesome, that's, okay. Yeah. Came to the right place. So what about tiny homes? So that's another thing, right? We talked about yeah. ADUs, tiny homes, and what's the, the other ones? The, uh, the container. Container, container homes, homes and all this stuff. What, what's your thoughts on all this? It comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. And I have actually a proposal out there to help someone develop like a prototype container home. The, so I guess they're all a little bit different but similar. I would say as far as permitting goes, if you want to take it back to permitting and zoning, zoning is not so hard because it's just going to be a lot coverage mm-hmm. type deal. But permitting is a little bit difficult because, one, they don't allow certain, sometimes under a certain amount of square footage per room and certain sizes. So it's hard to get the permit, and you have to be working with the city kind of very closely. So it pays to know, it pays to have that relationship with, with a city or county. So that's number one. And I find maybe a tiny home is different, but at least containers, what always seems to be on people's minds when they're asking is that maybe it's like significantly cheaper to build that way. Mm-hmm. But every time I've seen it kind of priced out, it's always been either the same or more. Wow. Uh, Good it's a lot of custom. It's a lot of custom and, and they're meant to be stacked on each other. So a shipping right. container is supposed to just sit on, you know, the four corners and the, the metal panel, the metal in between is what's kind of keeping the box from shifting. from shifting. The second you cut holes in the box, which are your doors, your windows, stuff like that, you're compromising the original structure of the mm-hmm. thing. So you have to somehow make up for it. So half of these shipping container houses or a shipping container anything is a shipping container with an additional structure on the inside. Mm-hmm. So, okay. <laughs> and then now you have to stack them. So now you have to put them up on kind of pylons on the, on the ground. So there's different things. It just presents different challenges. Makes sense. And then you have to put a roof on it anyway. And so then it, by the time you're done, it's, you're not saving any money, but right. it might, maybe it looks cool. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. going to say. It's cool art, 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 um, mm-hmm. architectural design or whatever. So, because okay. yeah, people a little trend you see on the internet is oh, Home Depot got these shells. You could buy a guest house from Home Depot for like thirty five grand and ship it to your house and just put it on the ground. What's that world look like? Same concept, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it it matters where you're doing it. So some places, if it's less than two hundred square feet. Sometimes you don't need a permit for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if it's livable area, so that that crosses some sort of line. So, you you know, what if someone, I don't know, what if something happens in the structure, roof collapses, and someone was sleeping in there, and it's on yeah. your property? There's, like, I don't know how much protection I there is. I bought it from Home Depot, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's <laughs> <laughs> Wow, okay. A lot and to th- think about. 
Right, and then if you want to permit it, the main thing, I guess, about structure, the main structural thing is how do you anchor the structure to the ground? Right. So you want to make sure all the forces on that thing, the building, are transferring into the, their load into the ground. And that's like the basic principle of structural engineering for a building. Mm -hmm. So now that's when it comes into, now you have to build like four little pylons out of concrete and then figure out how to connect that to, to the ground and stuff like that. So there's engineering involved. So that 35 grand is still good. I mean, it might still get you pretty far, but it's not just 35 grand. That's right. Of course, right. yeah. of course. But yeah, and then you still need a roof on it. I mean, a shipping container has mm -hmm. no roof, so the roof needs to shed. There's no insulation, there's no electrical, there's nothing. We, yeah. we had a, a mobile home interview today yeah. He's calling them aluminum castles. Yeah. That was aluminum amazing. Castles, yeah. <laughs> Tornado missiles. Tornado, yeah. So it kind of just reminds me of. Do you deal with mobile homes at all? You ever find anything around in that world? No, not really, actually. I mean, I've seen, pro like, when looking for property, I've seen it. But mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Cool, man. Awesome. So, so we got to start winding it up here. Yeah. Random question, though. Like, Phoenix City skyline, it's growing, but it's not like a major, like some of these major cities like LA, New York. So are you, are you into like skyscrapers and stuff like that or? Yeah, of course. Is, That's kind of, yeah, it's always been the dream. So I mentioned I like history, I like theory. So a lot mm -hmm. of the guys that, the big guys that came from Europe during like modernist times, mm -hmm. obviously there's Frank Lloyd Wright, but Chicago has kind of a big, rich architectural history. Mm -hmm. And Chicago is kind of like the birthplace of the of the high rise. Really? So those kind of things, yeah, I love them. And a lot of the fa the most famous American architects are ones from Chicago. So I was I forgot what I was reading, but it boils down to is it is it like really helpful for the city or is it like ego? Well, I mean, it, I guess you could frame it any way you want. Yeah. I did read a book about you know our cities being the most greenest invention. This is like I can't remember how long ago. But it was a spe it was a keynote speaker at an architecture convention, and it was the guy who did the Zappos guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. 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 And he's talking about, and since he was talking to a bunch of architects, he's like, "I read this book, and then oh, I wish I, I don't remember the book right now." But the thing about cities and density mm -hmm. is that if you concentrate all these ideas and all these people in one small area, that's when kind of all these ideas are generated. The more people, yes. Mm -hmm. So. It's you want to place ever, as many people as possible in the smallest amount of space as possible, and that's kind of the way to to grow. I don't know. Mm. I guess greener, smarter, all that stuff. Oh, ah, yeah. wow. like so Hong the, Kong. Yeah, and, those and little apartments. He, yeah, and he gave like <laughs> examples in India and stuff yeah. like that, where it's like hyper density, and how the states now kind of spread out a little bit more, so there's less opportunity for good yeah. ideas to happen. Wow. Connection. So do you think Phoenix is going that way? Or do you think? From which Phoenix is going in so many different ways, it mm -hmm. seems like. But I guess the main thing for Phoenix is it's not really landlocked like some of these other places. Right. that had They were forced, forced density. Phoenix doesn't really have, there's no, nothing True. saying stop sprawling. There's no environmental thing saying stop sprawling. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's hard and it's hard to, you know, uh, it's a whole political thing too. So it, it's, hard, it's hard to tell, but it, it has both. I think a lot of like city of Phoenix and a lot of properties that I look at are single family homes in historic districts that are zoned now multifamily oh. like the, and mm. the highest density multifamily. So they're trying wow. to encourage people to come and they're encouraged density around the core. So they do that. And then, cool. but then there's also obviously like a desert Ridge mm -hmm. and the way they control that is they give developers, you know, the more dense you kind of make it and the more space you give to the public, They'll allow you to, they'll alter your setbacks. They'll give you density credits, stuff like that. Hmm. So they are kind of, at least Phoenix is always trying to look for ways to make cities more dense. That's great. That was one of the things that, that and this is this goes to the architect of Phoenix. When I first moved here, moved from Chicago. So I'm used to downtown, everything being in one geographical area. And then when I moved here, I'm like, where's the downtown? You know, it's like. You see a couple of tall buildings here, and then you go down Central, it's more down there. So I, I never understood the way the city was developed because that's why I was like, well, with Chicago, it's the incubators, everything is in one central area. So that was a great question that you asked, Mike, you know, as far as. That's what I do. You know, <laughs> I'm here. That's good. You know, should it be spread out or should it be more dense? Well, yeah, I think Phoenix, whatever, for whatever reason, I think it boomed on the, on the outskirts. Yeah. Like the suburbs blew up 
like usually yeah city starts from within and grows mm-hmm. out phoenix seems like it they started out and we we're we're going in going in now. For, i don't know yeah. random information well, so dwell boldly right yes. yep what do you guys what's your core so as an investor of asria i want to have something built structural design and i'm coming to dwell boldly what should what's you what's your specialty what's your niche is it more multifamily is it more single family is it ground up development kind of I would say the the most typical type of investor client I deal with would be the spec home builder. Okay. So the large single family, whether it's going to be an Airbnb or they're going to buy and sell, so those tend to be my more my more core client base. So larger kind of single family, maybe four six thousand square feet. But I've you know I've helped people do small multifamily, and it is kind of a passion of mine too. Okay. Small multifamily, and it's going back. You you mentioned something before, Mike, about um, getting into arguments about how much can I build on this property mm-hmm. and one person says this, another person says that. Yeah. The biggest thing I find is even if the density number says, let's say it's 16 units, if you're 16, one or two units, let's say Phoenix again, you need one and a half parking spots for each unit. Uh-huh. So then that takes up a lot of space. So mm-hmm. parking, it's not really the density number and especially if we're looking at smaller properties but that would allow for multifamily the parking is what kind of can kill almost okay. any of these deals. Got it. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. So yeah. How, how do we get a hold of you? Call me. Go to my website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, of course, of course. Yeah. And what's that website? So it's dwell, D-W-E-L-L, boldly, B-O-L-D-L-Y.com. Do um, Ezra members get any discounts or benefits for working with you? Yeah, they do. So it's the main focus for me with Ezra members was to – give an, an easy way to get this zoning kind of analysis mm-hmm. done. So I take off 20% of the price for a zoning analysis, an IPA. Wow, awesome. Yeah. Okay. IPA you get a good. double IPA. You know? you get, you get. Yeah, double IPA. Huh? <laughs> awesome, man. As a real member, so become a member, reach out to Dwell Boldly, take advantage of your, your discount benefits or just read his articles in the newsletter, give him a call for a free consultation. What else we got? So, That's a wrap? That's a wrap. That's Thank a wrap. you, Nicholas. This, this is great you, information. It's different perspective. And it's always a value that you provide to yep. the Azria members. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks for listening to the Azria Show with your hosts, Marcus Maloney and Mike Delpreen. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you found this information valuable, head over to azria.org and learn more about our community.